Well, good afternoon. It's good to be here with you today, everybody. Um, so two of our folks had a big day yesterday. Joanne and Candy got married. We saw the cake. The evidence is here. Thanks for bringing the cake. Excited for that. Um, fortunately, if you missed it, uh, I have the same sermon to give to you all today. So, <laughs> all right, not really, not really. Although I'm, I feel like it's the same point, but it's it's slightly different, it's slightly different. All right, so let's begin uh, with the sung prayer. I'm gonna, if you know, guide my feet. Feel free to sing with me. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Amen. Um, sorry, it sounds like a whole train is running through the hallway. <laughs> all right, good, good. Um, all right, Anne and Heather are driving a train through the hallway. Wonderful. Um, so as part of getting ready for the season of Lent, I was thinking about each of our weeks as having their own little theme, uh, sort of habits of the heart for developing in our Christian faith. Um, and last week that theme was trust, although we kind of ended up in a different place hearing about Abram and God's covenant, thinking about what it would mean to be an heir of God's kingdom. Uh, for this week, the starting point, the habit of the heart, so to speak, is gratitude. Gratitude for all the ways that God is present in our lives, for the, from the simple and the sustaining to the dramatic and the devastating. Through it all, we can discern God's generosity, stay present to it, and be thankful for it. A habit of the heart that feeds and strengthens all the rest of our life of faith. So our text from today... Uh, for today from Isaiah comes at a dramatic and devastating time in the life of the people of Israel. This comes long after King David, who we may remember as something like the George Washington of Israel. He was Israel's most famous king. He united all the tribes and even won quite a few battles, presiding over the largest territory of Israel in its ancient history. But after King David and his son Solomon, things just never quite go as well for the country and the people of Israel. David happened to hit on a time when the real superpowers in the area, the giant empires in the neighborhood, just happened to be having a bad couple of generations. But after David, these empires start to wake up and decide they don't like having an independent little Israel hanging out on the borders. It takes a while, several hundred years in fact, but eventually, the powers that be in Babylon decide to invade Jerusalem, to take anybody with authority, leadership, or wealth captive, and cart them back to the capital city as exiles from their own land. The remaining people are leaderless and powerless as far as being able to resist the rule of the invaders. It's hard not to feel like, in a situation like that, that God is punishing you. The people living in Babylon certainly felt that way. That back in the old days when they were worshiping at other altars, when they were forsaking God's commands, when they were forgetting justice in favor of taking advantage of the poor and the powerless, that all these things had come to a head in this defeat, in this removal, in this exile. And as a people, they live with this guilt and this sadness and grief for 50 long years. They're taking up their forced residence in Babylon, but they never really feel at home. And then comes this prophecy from God through Isaiah. It starts with a strange image, an amazing feast. God invites the people to come and drink, no cash needed. Come and eat without spending a dime. A rich feast is laid out for you, my people, if only you'll accept it, if only you'll come. Sounds good to me. Next we hear about God's promise to the people of Israel, a promise to care for the house of David. David's descendants, to keep the covenant with David of an everlasting throne, even now when the Babylonians have killed the last of his direct descendants. Somehow, on the other side of all that loss, God is going to make a way, keep the promise, and build something new in the rubble and the ashes, 
And finally, the prophecy closes with this. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord, nor are my thoughts your thoughts. Have you ever been in a spot where you felt trapped by the circumstances? It seems like there are just no good options to get out of this bad situation. Or it seems so convoluted, so intractable, that it's impossible. And then you get some good advice. A friend puts a new light on things, shows the problem from a whole different perspective. Or something small but important changes everything dramatically, and suddenly you have a new outlook on the whole situation. Now, multiply that by 10,000, and that's what God is doing in this passage, telling the people of Israel that as lost and as hopeless as they feel, as abandoned and left behind and full of grief as they are, that there is another perspective, another way of looking at things, and that way is full of God's generosity. Because what our passage today is telling us is that, unlike for most of us mere mortals who get stuck in tight places and feel the pinch and feel our limits and get tired and get too stubborn to change, unlike us humans who can't always take the long view, we're only human after all, God's creativity, God's generosity, don't end. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord, and neither are your thoughts my thoughts. God's covenant with David still stands, even after 50 years of exile, and that loving covenant, even though it may change its shape and its vessels, is still a feast for the people of Israel, and one that God gives without demanding any cover charge. And it's open bar, no money needed. The buffet table is ready. Grab your plate. The end of the story is this. The people of Israel, after 50 years in exile, have a new chance. They return from Babylon to Jerusalem. And the road is hard, but God sustains them in the return home. And that is the community Jesus is born into 500 years later. A community that has feasted at God's table and has learned to give thanks for it and to trust. Today, God invites us again to a feast, a feast of bread and wine, but also much more than that. This is a feast of forgiveness and connection, forged in Jesus' sacrificial death and miraculous resurrection. Every day, God's creation gives us these gifts, food to eat, water and wine, and grape juice to drink, and then that feast goes on, beyond our physical needs, to the spirit, to being part of a body and a way of life, to learning and growing as a community centered in gratitude, joy, and living right with justice and love. All that in a simple loaf of bread. All that in a sustaining cup of juice. This is the food that satisfies. This is the wine that quenches our thirst. This is the well of water bubbling up to eternal life. May this feast build us into a community that gives thanks to God and trusts. In Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen.